Daniel Bernardi. He is a senior partner engineer um, of and in charge of developer relations at Twitter. Uh, so Jeremy, uh, sorry, Daniel is part of the developer relations team at Twitter, helping developers build better apps. His passion and job is to inspire developers all over the world to create the best Twitter API integrations that can in turn raise the bar for the entire ecosystem. And prior to joining Twitter, Danielle uh, has been a founder, a CTO, a solutions engineer, and a developer for companies such as Sail Through, Rich Relevance, My Good Client, and also Facebook. Um, now, in this talk, he's going to be talking about health oriented design. Um, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, so, hi there, Danielle. How are you going? Hello, hello. Uh, good morning, almost afternoon, Australia. Yeah, yeah. Good to have you with us. Good to be here as always. And you're beaming in from, you're in the US as well, I think, aren't you? Yes, not too far from Jeremy. I am on the opposite side of the bay in uh, Auckland. Ah, uh -huh, so okay. Auckland with a no. Uh, so it's uh, um, not as smoky as the other uh, rest of the week or last week, yep, getting yep. better by the yep. day. So that's, that's, uh, that's pretty good. Good to hear, good to hear. All right, um, so we're ready for your talk, Health Oriented Design. Um, do you want to share your slides now? Yes. And there we go. Okay, we can see them. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so it's uh, very interesting to uh, be here and talk about this uh, because when I first started this presentation, I started to think about it. it would, I started to think about it around. Uh, October last year, and we knew that 2020 was going to be uh, such a key year for the future of data and information. Um, and I started thinking about this when none of this was even remotely imaginable. Yet uh, all this still holds true, and maybe is even uh, you know accelerated by the current events. Um, the United, the United Nations said it's tackling what it calls an infodemic. So it's hard to distinguish information that's not trustworthy from a reasonable and objective information that contributes to the progress of the public conversation. And it's usually a largely uh, manual process. It requires a lot of vetting from uh, uh, trustworthy uh, parties or uh, reviewers um, and obviously presents scaling challenges. So for example, when uh, we tackle what we called an infodemic, how do we get the full data set on a topic? Or how do we direct people to the right information? And how do we contrast and report misleading or uh, inaccurate details? We see platforms trying to get to the roots of the issue. Back in 2018, uh, Jack Dorsey, for example, made a commitment to increase the health of the public conversation. The public conversation is the conversation we have every day on the internet. Our thoughts, our way to express ourselves, the way we receive and consume information. Uh, but what's interesting here is that Jack doesn't just give the definition of public conversation, it gives a definition of health. So what's the health of the public conversation? When we talk about health of the public conversation, we refer to any activity that uh, adds uh, to your life in a positive way. We go online to learn, to inform ourselves, to connect with others. We uh, go online to keep ourselves updated on the latest TikTok dances and uh, moves. When we choose to make our collective inter interactions public, we shape a global conversation that can uh, advance us as a society. But when we look back at the actual implementation of an API, what API design allows us to make that much progress? How can we design an API so it's health-oriented? It's a challenge that uh, platforms had in the past, so this is nothing new, really. API platforms were designed to work with objects, but the notion of object stops at what an object is. Um, APIs know where an object is. They know what the type of the object is. Obviously, they return the object's content. But they also act in a silo, and they have no awareness uh, of the context of the object itself. So in order to enable users and developers with tools for healthier conversations, we first need to design APIs that are 
aware of their surrounding context. Right now, endpoints don't say much about the context around that object. Uh, we have the object's content, we have plenty of metadata, but the ability to frame that object into a much larger picture is always left out of uh, an API product. And uh, here's an example. Suppose you wanted to get all the tweets sent on Mother's Day. What would you do? You would probably go and search by keywords. You'll have to look for specific texts uh, and hashtags in order to get an initial set of tweets. But this is largely incomplete because the conversation can shift a lot in tone and in context, just like it happened this year with a, a lot of mothers in the front line who couldn't celebrate the way they deserved. So this is an incomplete keyword. Uh, and it's um, just a keyword uh, search query that uh, uh, would look like this if we were to only target three languages. But what if someone forgot to use a hashtag or what if they used a slightly different uh, set of words? What if, it, what if there is a typo in the tweet? And can you imagine how big our search query has to be in order to capture the full conversation in many languages across the world? So how can we make an API aware of its surrounding context in this case? So I think artificial intelligence can help here, particularly uh, language processing and natural language processing. Platforms invested significant efforts into AI in the past few years aiming their efforts to help moderation and internal processes. So we seem to be in a fairly mature stage to see useful applications of this. Uh, and uh, we believe we're also in a position to open up this uh, applications to the broader developer ecosystem. So one way to achieve contextual awareness is by annotating text through named entity recognition so that we can map text to things like names and places whenever we recognize uh, re reasonably recognize these things. Even if we're not in the same language, for example, these tweets are about the same topic, a holiday called Mother's Day. We can then start representing things like tweets, not just in form of keywords, but in form of uh, entities. Uh, so in form, um, uh, when, when we talk about that in the health and design, those three tweets will share the same annotations. Uh, they will have the same payloads and it will be returned consistently, no matter what the language and the actual content is. And we can use entities to get tweets about specific context we're looking for. So this way we can go from this search query that I showed before to this. And we can still use keywords, for example, to further refine our search or to find specific areas of the conversation within this uh, broader and well understood topic. For example, you know, Mother's Day in the context of uh, not being able to go uh, a, a celebrate outside. The real power and the reason this works so well is also because named entity recognition is aware of the surrounding context of a particular piece of information. So let's take this tweet, for example. Tigers will be back in San Francisco playing against the Giants. So this might sound familiar to a certain audience that's familiar with either sports or uh, uh, maybe it's from the US. The recognized entities here are exactly the Detroit Tigers and the San Francisco Giants. So why San Francisco is not an entity? It's not an entity in this case because we're not talking about the city of San Francisco, but we're about. Uh, but the tweet is about a team based in San Francisco. So, like I said, this could be something that's familiar to somebody. But I come from Europe, uh, we're in um, API days Australia, and we might have a limited understanding on who the Tigers and the Giants are. We know we can infer the their sports teams, but of which sports? So this is exactly the problem with the lack of contextual awareness. And with the new Twitter API, for example, we embed this kind of uh, annotations directly in the API response because we want to make sure that uh, we surround our information with the context in which this information is uh, being created in the first place. So in this case, when we look at the overall context, you see uh, that we're talking about baseball. Um, and so those are two baseball teams and uh, MLB, Major League Baseball specifically. Uh, and this is basically the power of uh, uh, named entity recognition and contextual awareness in uh, an API design. And this is what's available in the V2 API that we just released not too long ago. And this is how platform can, uh, platforms can share their API for uh, help. So here we're taking a radically different approach for our new API platform, as I uh, just uh, explained. We know that developers want to improve the public conversation, but they don't feel that you know, they don't have the means to 
make a positive impact uh, either. So we have two, a two folder strategy to make sure that developers can actually actively contribute to that. First, we give developers the tools to better understand the public conversation. All you saw so far, like I said, it's available right now in the new Twitter API. And second, we give developers better tools so they can help their users have a more, uh, more of a better experience online that can limit the amount of known content or content that's not relevant um, that you have to see and witness. And an example of this is the COVID-19 stream endpoints. This is an API that we released earlier this year and still uh, active uh, that gives developers a real-time stream of tweets about the COVID-19 topic. Um, and it works by uh, using the same technology I showed before, which is uh, train tweets to detect COVID-19 stream um, to, and the topic and to return this information to filter out all the things that are not uh, COVID-19 related. Making this accessible for free is one of the most unique and valuable things that I've seen to are doing uh, as the world comes together to protect our communities and to seek answers to pressing challenges. Like I said, the stream serves a real-time data set of tweets filtered by the uh, COVID-19 context annotation. And this API only returns tweets that are marked as COVID-19 by our uh, internal artificial intelligence. So uh, this is, uh, a, a huge advantage that you can uh, get out of the box. So this is how it, it worked. Uh, we give uh, context annotation and this is uh, available in the new Twitter API, and then we use them to the uh, to further the public conversation. And this API is think uh, is built thinking of health. In the legacy world, for example, you would need access to the data set, then you will set up your right keywords to get the best possible corpus to begin with, to use as a training model for uh, your uh, natural entity recognition models. Then you have to uh, purchase uh, computing services, then you have to implement the um, entity recognition models, trial, error, it takes forever. Um, and uh, there are also some entity recognition API in the marketplace, but they're not trained on a data set of tweets. So, for maximum accuracy, you would need to train your own models. In the health oriented designs, uh, we just have an integrated API that just works and gives you all the information you need. So you can just uh, activate it for uh, uh, the understanding of the public conversation as you need. And there's no doubt a health oriented design like this one uh, enables a better developer experience, which in turn can have positive implications in the ecosystem. With just one single endpoint, developers now are able to research the spread of the disease understand the spread of misinformation, or even build solutions for crisis management or emergency response, and to communicate with uh, within communities. So giving better understanding via context awareness is only one aspect of a health-oriented API. Building better tools is the second aspect. Uh, for uh, content platforms, an aspect of this is conversational health. This means that everybody should feel safe and comfortable sharing their thoughts on the internet. But sometimes people re may receive replies that are irrelevant or off topic or just downright toxic. Uh, they may find it difficult or even not possible to prevent those problems. So it's not ideal for the platform and it's not ideal for people using the platform. Last year, we added a way to hide replies to a conversation. People hide replies for many reasons, including to remove comments that are abusive or just irrelevant, off topic, or distracting. So while many people want the benefit of hiding replies to improve the quality of their conversations, some people receive such a, a large number of replies that it's difficult or overwhelming to do so without help. Additionally, some people may want uh, to automatically hide replies that contain offensive or abusive language so they don't have to be exposed to it in the first place. So even when given the tools, they might not have the time, the energy, or even the emotional fortitude to deal with all this. And this is where a health-oriented API can help. With um, an API platform with the tools that uh, to solve these problems at scales, developers can then help solve uh, this problem for their users so that all the users can have a better and safer experience. An example of health-oriented API that improves the public conversation is the Hide Replies API. With this API, developers can build tools that help people hide replies to their tweets faster, more efficiently, 
or in circumstances in which they will normally give up or not even have the tools. So this is an API that increase healthy participation in the public conversation. Uh, a user can uh, delegate hiding replies to an app based on criteria this app defines. Here's how it will work. The user tweets as usual. Then behind the scenes, an app integrated with this API checks for replies. And this can even happen in real time. The app then check for one or more criteria. For example, an app can check if the user wants to hide replies containing one or more words or uh, coming from specific users, for example, users without a profile picture. Natural language processing can also be used to hide replies that are off topic or not relevant. Uh, there's a good example from uh, Jigsaw, which is a unit within Google. Um, they have an API called Perspective. This API is trained to automatically detect text that is likely to be abusive. And by using the Twitter API together, they can um, receive a reply in real time, detect potential abuse using perspective, and then hide the reply accordingly. Same with uh, our own built-in context annotations. You can create a tool that can uh, uh, understand for each tweet if a tweet is sports related or not, or it's talking about celebrity or pets or many others of uh, the topics uh, that we make available through the API. And if um, a tweet is off topic with the main conversation, you can hide it. So you may think that uh, uh, this is something that's far into the future, but uh, API and services like this exist right now, and there are many. Uh, this is you know, the perspective API, which I just mentioned, using machine learning models to score the perceived impact that a comment might have on a conversation. Um, so the perspective API ranks text with uh, a score and helps moderators uh, do, their, do their job, but uh, it's also making readers uh, to more easily uh, find relevant information. Uh, this API is also integrated with Twitter, so uh, you can just link a Twitter account and real-time replies that have a like, uh, likelihood of being toxic are automatically hidden. Uh, this example is actually available for you for free, open source to clone and to customize the way you want it uh, on uh, the documentation websites on uh, developer.twitter.com. And when enabling experiences like this, end users uh, are not the only two benefits because your platform immediately creates a whole new ecosystem that cooperates with your app and embeds into it to improve the main experiences. This puts developers front and center into your app, opening up to new opportunities for them to enable better experiences. So in the legacy world, we saw users rely on themselves to improve the main online experiences. This stops in 2020. This could be challenging for internal processes as well, which is why it stops today. Um, this is why uh, we built endpoints like this, because uh, platforms uh, that uh, rely on manual processes will never be able to scale and will never be able to create experiences that uh, will uh, really expose the fruition of content that matters. So in a health-oriented world, uh, uh, we see developers actively contributing to the main user experience. Uh, we can direct them and help them with tools to perform tasks like moderations uh, that were too cumbersome to tackle. And developers can also help the API platform scale in areas where you can't focus your efforts. And this is the case where uh, you're localizing in a, re in a region where you don't have a focused understanding or even a market presence. Opening up the main experience can allow developers in that country to improve it because they have the best possible understanding. Uh, and partnering closely with these developers can also increase the understanding of the region or market for the mutual benefits of the developer community, your platforms, and also uh, users. So this new API design embeds directly into the core experience to make it better. And developers don't have to build alternatives. Instead, they have a place in your main experience, your app, your platform, um, where they can use their skills to improve it for everybody. And in turn, this creates and nurtures an ecosystem of advanced integrations where developers are not simply vendors, but bring their own expertise in their market and country and factor into the main experience. So by giving developers tools for a better understanding from one end and better tools to action their understanding on the other, you can create an advanced ecosystem that respects and improves everyone's experience online. And uh, that's what I had. Um, happy to see if there are any questions. Um, thank you.
Okay, thanks so much for that, Danielle. That was a, that was um, fascinating talk, um, and um, yeah, definitely such an interesting topic. Um, trying to moderate um, and kind of create a healthier healthier conversation uh, on uh, Twitter, and um, yeah, very much a hot topic. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to post them um, in the stay in the chat um, on the stage. Um, but I was kind of wondering. So, what's the? Do you have a sense of what the uptake is so far of Twitter users for, say, the hide replies um, feature? Um, has it already? You know, has there been a big uptake so far? Or yes, uh, from um, pretty much all users. Uh, and, you know, during the experimentation phase, we were uh, uh, really kind of curious to understand what the impact would have been, like how would uh, a regular user use it, how brands would use it, how politicians would use it, you know. And um, there, th there's one key thing to uh, highlight in the, um, in the case of my replies. It's not called delete replies or... Uh, you know, moderate replies. It's called high replies for a reason because replies are just getting moved to a different section of the conversation, but that are still available. So you still have the complete conversation, uh, but you just organize it better. So what what is the kind of replies you're trying to hide? Maybe there are replies that are off topic or uh, replies that are about, uh, uh, you know, supporting. So you can basically make the conversation more relevant and that's the whole point of my replies and i think that's the message that uh, users all over the world uh, have embraced and understood very clearly yeah okay and how do so how do you measure um whether the conversation is becoming healthier on twitter do are there metrics that you kind of look at to figure out whether it is kind of you know it's becoming a, a more um you know that it's becoming more supportive more friendly uh or, or a more good you know a good dialogue yeah there's uh, there's a lot of data points we take into consideration we're we're not really into engagements so we're not looking to have users tweet more but we have mm. users tweet more confidently like what we're trying to get out of uh, health of the party conversation is healthy use of uh, twitter it's not use it more, it's use it meaningfully. Um, yeah. And as such, uh, we measure things like, you know, not like the amount of likes a tweet gets, uh, but we understand if there's a conversation going on. So if the user, if, if users are more uh, safely tweeting uh, or things like, what is the time that a user spends blocking and using people uh, as opposed to tweeting? Because obviously, you know, if you if part of your day is spent by managing your followers or just muting or blocking things that uh, don't matter to you, then you're not making the best use of your time not there. The group, yeah, uh, yeah. So we we have those are just you know a few of the metrics, but the metric the measurement framework for head replies has been uh, insane uh, because we wanted to make sure that we had the right data points and we didn't leave any uh, leaf uh, unturned. Yeah, it's a challenging thing to to measure. Yeah. I can see, um, okay, now we've got a question here from um, Senad Ameti, um, who's asked, can any of these APIs be used outside of Twitter? Are there any white papers that describe the work that you've done? I think you said these these can be used outside of Twitter. Uh, is that right? These are all available open source for developers to, to use. That is correct. So uh, I talked about uh, tweet annotations, high replies, and the COVID-19 stream. Uh, tweet annotate, so those are all available in um, um, for uh, the public platform. Uh, if you have a use case for the public goods, you can apply for use of uh, the COVID-19 stream endpoints. Uh, you need to make sure that the use case is, again, for the public good, for non-commercial use cases, and you have the capacity of ingesting this huge amount of tweets in real time, which is not easy feat. Uh, mm -hmm. And the rest is available today, right now. So annotations are just available. Uh, so if you sign up for uh, um, the Twitter API right now, the tweet lookup endpoint, search, filter stream, all the new endpoints have context annotations available, and we just return that information. So that's our first party uh, ML models uh, that uh, are available to you. I'm, I'm sure there's uh, uh, white papers that describe how to, um, how, how was the basically the science, the data science behind that. 
mm-hmm. um, out there, and I can find the information for sure. And okay, maybe uh, we re- can ha- post them in sorry, the chat later or something. Yes, and yeah. high replies is also available. And we have a, a good ecosystem. I had to say, I actually worked uh, first person to pretty much most of these endpoints. Uh, and the ecosystem of our replies is the thing I'm the most proud of. People yeah. came with uh, like all the examples I just uh, I just described. It's you know not just me. It's uh, the developer community that enabled those. Yeah, yeah, great work. Okay, um, we've also got a question from Alok Mishra. Um, says thank you, Danielle. Um, contextual APIs make a lot of sense. How do organizations working on their customer interactions take advantage of these features in Twitter for their specific domains? For customer interaction, I think uh, it kind of goes uh, outside the realm of uh, you know health of the party conversation in a way. Uh, but uh, there, there's so like there are so many applications of uh, contextual annotations. For example, uh, for brands and uh, the interaction with customers, like. How you can understand how customers are talking about the brands by identifying this sub conversation. So, for example, is somebody talking about Toyota in the context of a sports car, or because they're actually looking for a new car? And that's something that annotations can help you uh, really accelerate as a conversation. Or, uh, you know, people talking about tea, uh, they're talking about flavors of tea. Uh, how can you match your brands, which is also uh, returned as a context? Uh, uh, annotation and the flavor and understand how uh, people can um, request or even you know understand the demand the global demand for a new flavor of tea that you as a brand didn't have that's actually an interesting uh, case study that uh, um, Lipton had uh, uh, not too long ago they basically accelerated the launch of uh, their matcha uh, iced tea flavor because uh. they were inspecting the public conversation and they understood that uh, it was in a high demand. It basically became high uh, mainstream, and uh, they had it in the pipeline. That they weren't sure about the sequencing, and by basically accelerating the sequencing, they got uh, a huge return on investment based on that. Wow, yeah, that's interesting. And the other yeah. th- the other question that I was kind of wondering about is, so if if your uh, re- say you some you know someone tweets and you reply and your reply is blocked or hidden, what's your experience? Do you do you get a note saying, hey, you know, like your reply, uh, there was a problem with it or, you know, it's been hidden or, you know, it was considered abusive or, or, or that kind of thing or? Uh, no, it does not. And the reason is you, you define your rules. Um, so as, a, for example, uh, as a user, I, high replies that are not relevant to the conversation. So when I was talking about the Twitter API v2, somebody asked for support. I I did two things. I hit that reply and then I reached out through the M and said, look, I'm going to move this to you know the the parking lot. Uh, mm-hmm. but we're going to address the support in the in the forum. So I it, it's basically you know house policy and you define your policy when engaging to a community. So the it's also a shift in the mindset of how do you use Twitter. Uh, so when we should probably start and thinking about communities more and higher reply is kind of, it's the very interesting starting seeds to create a community about a topic. Um, one thing that uh, I saw people doing was to just add uh, uh, a short uh, description in their profile bio saying, um, you know, I'm going to hide replies. I don't block uh-huh. the hide replies. Okay. Uh, yeah. Or yeah, uh, brands can uh, also use things like you know, if, what, if you want to engage with this account, please read the rules here. There's a kind of code of conduct basically uh, yeah. that uh, can be finally implemented. And you know, uh, if they w- this works for uh, a multitude of users. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. All right. Well, I think we we're, we're pretty much out of time there. But thanks so much. Um, th- yeah. That's that's uh, fascinating um, developments there at Twitter, and no doubt is going to um, improve the health of everyone's experience there. 